So tell me how you travel back and forth from Australia <laughs> and still manage to be coherent when you show up here. Yeah, I think it's important to kind of balance it, um, get into nature, still try and get some sunlight, feet on the ground when you can, as much rest as you can, uh, meditate if you can, and uh, yeah, just try and balance it as much as possible so that you can stay um, centered and still functional to get as much work done as possible and maximize the trip. <laughs> Do you spring for business class so you get a white flat seat? <laughs> no, I still fly economy. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Yeah, it's one of those things where business class is like five times the price. Right. And the way that everything's traveling at Mana, there's just so many beautiful ways we can spend extra revenue, uh, including reinvesting into um, product inventory and, and R&D for new products. So... I'm super fortunate on planes that I can sleep a lot, so that helps. Even sitting up? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. I remember uh, a couple of years ago, well, a few years ago now, I um, had a speaking gig in London, and I just don't go anywhere unless I can fly business, especially on a long flight. I have to have a flat seat. I just, I'm not trying to be, you know, it's not, it's not a vanity mm. thing. It's literally just, I will lose my shit if I'm sitting in the seat. And they're like, yeah, we got it. We got it. No, you know, we got you a business class seat. And I got on the plane and it was like, I forget what airline, but the seats kind of go three quarters way back, <laughs> you know, which is like even worse. So I just ended up putting the seat up because you, you're not really lying down. You're not sitting up. It's kind of in between. And I was like, never again. I have to make sure I, I stipulate, you know, in, in the contract. Uh, again, not trying to be, you know, um, fancy or anything. It's just brutal. I don't know how people do it. But yeah, I mean, you know, you're you're in the process of building a company. And so if you can save that money and spend it where it's more uh, a better use, it makes sense. So you were here last year, I think our episode number 468 came out in April, 2023. And we had a fantastic conversation. People love that episode. So I'm excited to have you back. Uh, what's new in your personal life, business life? What, what's happening? in the year uh, that's passed. Yeah, so the business has exploded from a sales and revenue perspective, which has been amazing. And like I was saying to you just before the podcast, it's kind of one thing to create an amazing finished product, but then when the sales start and the management, the operations of the project is quite intense, something I actually underestimated. So our team's built... Um, and just all of the little things like the customer service, the consistency of what comes at you for that first, well, it just doesn't stop actually. So 24 seven. So myself and Brad McDonnell who run the business uh, work seven days a week from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to sleep. Oh man. Yeah. So it's You're still in the seven day phase. Yeah. 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 Which is beautiful. Um, and yeah, it's super challenging. I mean, a lot of the reason for that as well is we've, invested into three new products. Uh, two have been released in the last two months. And then we've got the gold, the mana gold coming out in June. So just a lot of intense focus. You know, one of the things we've learned over the years is where you would put your attention. Um, you know, that's, you get the result where you put your attention and energy grows from that space. So um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, a choice for us to kind of develop that obsession in the substances and the raw materials that we deal with. And uh, yeah, we love the process. We wouldn't have it any other way. However, it is a lot. <laughs> Do you plan on staying in Australia as your home base? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I love it there. Yeah, you, you, you text me photos uh, sometimes. Sometimes they come in spurts and then I'll start texting you and all of our photos are like sunrises and sunsets you're like my sun gazing brother you know that are is super committed to that um i mean imagining part of i haven't been to australia but i it, i'm guessing you live somewhere near uh the ocean and you are in a position where you can see the sun a lot based on what you text me yeah so actually for the last decade i've been living in the hinterland of the sunshine coast which is about a 30 minute drive and it's at elevation so that's really good for seeing the sunrise. I can't see the sunrise from my little cabin, but I've just got to drive up the hill a little bit further. 
and there's a beautiful lookout. Um, that cabin, the actual roof collapsed on it about four months ago. It was super old. Uh, and so I've actually moved down the coast now, um, right near the beach. Sweet. So that's uh, Sweet. It's a beautiful location because we can see the sunrise and go for an early morning swim, an early morning walk, and um, it's a beautiful way to start the day. Epic. And yeah. tell people why you're into sun gazing. Yeah, I mean, it's the most powerful thing that I've ever still found, the most powerful practice. And I guess because the sun is really the source of all life and that light that comes from the sun, especially early morning or late afternoon, it has so many of the light codes that are so important for our cellular biology and so important for our internal biocircuitry and our biochemistry and our bioenergetic field as well. So it's like we discussed last time, uh, the body is the most advanced technology in the universe. So once we accept that, if we zoom out, it's like with any technology, we want to be able to upgrade the hardware and the software. So the codes from the sun is really one of the best ways to do that. Have you heard of this Australian guy, Santos Bonacci? Yes. I was listening to a podcast. Is that how you say his last name? Bonacci? Yes. Yeah. I was listening to a podcast uh, on which he was a guest and he was talking about um, how the sun is actually a concentrated rainbow. Like, you know, he's he's he, he makes a habit of debunking a lot of things about our cosmology and the nature of our earthly realm and astrology and things like that, as you probably know. Um, but I thought that was really interesting. You know, I was like, yeah, the sun isn't a fiery ball as we've been taught. It's just a, it's just a round rainbow. And we probably don't see it that way because of the visible light spectrum. We look at the sun, it looks kind of yellow or kind of white, and then a little orange in the morning <laughs> and night. But <clears throat> with our naked eye, we can't see that it does have that full spectrum of light. And that's the light that creates rainbows. So it's really, really interesting. I never heard that before. Yeah, and that white light, which is really how we see it when it's not in a sunrise or a sunset situation, white light contains all light. Oh, right. So all the colors of the rainbow exist within white light. And even within the yellow and golden color, that also contains all wave forms of light. So gold, as an example, is crystallized light in a metallic form. And that color actually holds all the wavelength lengths of visible light. Gold does? Yes. Interesting. Yeah. And actually, since we've been dealing with the nano gold that's in our new product, we've had that experience directly, that the different size nanoparticles and the different shape and the different charge reflect different wave lengths of light. So the smaller nanoparticles, around 10 nanoparticles are actually red. And then when you get up to 100, they're purple. And that whole spectrum from red, which is the lowest frequency light, to purple or violet, which is the highest, and everything in between is the colors of the rainbow. So wow. even at a nanoparticle size, gold holds all those different frequencies of light. That's epic. Um I interviewed a guy named Dr. Edward Group the other day from a company called Global Healing, like a really high-end, beautiful, beautiful uh, product line that he's created over the years. And one of his new products is a methylene blue. Mm -hmm. And he puts the monoatomic gold in there and explains something about the refraction of light. And because methylene blue is photodynamic, uh, as are metals like silver and gold. And I've heard of people putting colloidal silver in methylene blue. So I did that myself as just an experiment, you know, not really knowing what I'm doing, but just like, ah, it makes sense, you know? Um, but yeah, he, I forget how he explained it exactly, but it was really interesting. It had something to do with increasing the potential of the uh, photobiomodulation element of methylene blue. And I bet it has something to do with what you're talking about. Makes sense, yeah. Uh, I mean, colloidal silver and colloidal golds, they're kind of, I see them as like pseudo products to some extent. They're not necessarily real particles of silver or gold. Uh, however, like the atomic size of gold is super interesting as well when we're talking about monoatomic, like 
mono obviously meaning one atom, uh, and the radius of a gold atom is about 0.144 um, nanometers, and 144 is actually the number of light as well. So there's kind of like a little clue there with the gold. Interesting. Um, but once we get into the nanometer size of gold, and I'm talking um, pure gold, pure 24 karat gold, um, it has the cap the capability and capacity to hold all different waveforms of light. So it actually changes color, again, depending on the size, shape, and charge. And it can actually pass through the blood-brain barrier, which is the most selective part of the body, because of that size charge and shape as well the shape being the geometry so you can have it like little stars or little spheres really yeah yeah so right now because i just had some of your your mana gold your new product which is not out at the time of this recording but will be uh for those watching you can see what it looks like right here beautiful packaging by the way so right now i have uh, atoms of gold in my brain <laughs> I mean, do. I, I took it like, I don't know, 30 minutes ago or something. Yeah. So there's the atomic world and then you get into the nano world. And the nano world is kind of, let's say you have 10 nanometers. That's a cluster of approximately 30 gold atoms. So under that doesn't really pass through the blood brain barrier. And then above 100 nanometers doesn't really pass through the blood brain barrier. So there's a sweet spot there. Um, and yeah, nano gold acts very different to metallic gold the main difference is that it's bioavailable so it doesn't accumulate in the body as heavy metal if it's around that 10 nanometer size it can pass through the uh the kidneys and and leave within our urine and if it's a little bit bigger it will pass through our liver and leave through our stool but it doesn't accumulate in the body so there's no risk of of heavy metal so you're what I would consider to be an alchemist based on our first conversation. I mean, the stuff you're doing with Ormus and sea minerals and Shilaji, like that seems to be your lane. Would you classify yourself as that too? Or is there a better word for your model? <laughs> like what drives you and the kind of tinkering you do with these different substances? Yeah, it's really an obsession for the truth, Luke. And none of this is new. It's been used by the Egyptians. It's been used by the Essenes. It's written about in a lot of sacred text. I guess nowadays we have the opportunity with technology to play with things like nanoparticles in a very precise way and actually do clinical studies and test a lot of these things. Um, you know, at the moment there's, a, there's actually a term called plasmon resonance or surface plasmon resonance where they're using this in mainstream medicine uh, in they're using gold nanoparticles in these different nanometer sizes to actually induce coherent light emissions at the cellular level. It turns into energy and they're using it to treat all kinds of things. Really? So, yeah. That's interesting because, you know, what I've learned and my knowledge of this is limited. <laughs> so in layman's terms, what I've learned is that the mitochondria actually produce infrared light, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. And it has a lot to do with why infrared saunas are great for energy production and so on. Uh, cold thermogenesis, doing ice baths, right? There's something that stimulates your mitochondria to make more infrared light. And then somehow that's related to making the exclusion zone water mm -hmm. in your body. It's super interesting. I mean, it's most of it's a bit over my head. So I just kind of take the broad strokes and go, yeah, mm. <laughs> do more saunas, do more ice baths, you know, and drink structured water and do the things that I do. But I think we're headed in a place that's really interesting, especially, as you said, when mainstream science, who, you know, are, includes, of course, many brilliant people and in innovations, but also in some ways is very archaic and in some cases even destructive and antithetical to life. So the fact that they're starting to apply some of this uh, science is really interesting. Yeah, it's awesome. And it's, it's a sign of the times that we're in as well. Uh, as I said, this has been used throughout antiquity and it usually presents itself at specific times in specific cycles. And really it's about getting more light into the biology. So it's increasing that quotient of light, upregulating more bioluminescence within our body. And that, really allows us to transform 
that biochemistry, upgrade that biocircuitry. And once we can operate in that higher frequency state, our entire reality can change. Like most people with a pulse, I love the taste of coffee. But what I don't like is the jitters and crash that often come with it. So to solve this, I went looking for a morning drink that gives me lasting energy without those pesky side effects. Well, that's exactly what I found when I discovered the incredible Nandaka formula from Peak. Nandaka is made with fermented pu'er teas that give you slow-release caffeine for sustained energy while supporting a healthy gut at the same time. And the ceremonial-grade Peruvian cacao in Nandaka helps rev up your metabolism and makes the compounds in Nandaka even more bioavailable. And it goes without saying, uh, to make something part of my morning routine, it's got to taste incredible too. And this one does. It's like a creamy, spiced hot chocolate. To make my morning drink, I throw one sachet in a cup and a half of hot water, froth it for a few seconds, and I'm good to go. And for a limited time, you can get 15% off Nandaka, plus a free rechargeable frother and cup over at peaklife.com luke. That's P-I-Q-U-E-L I-F-E, peaklife.com slash Luke. And by the way, Nandaka also comes loaded with a blend of highly concentrated functional mushrooms like chaga, reishi, cordyceps, and lion's mane. All these ingredients work together to relieve stress and improve your mood. Nandaka is an awesome morning ritual. In fact, I've got a cup sitting on my desk right now to power me through these promos. So to get your hands on some of this stuff, head over to peaklife.com slash Luke and get 15% off Nandaka, plus your free frother and cup, all for a limited time. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, every aspect of the body is an electrical circuit and has an electrical potential. So we even measure, measure within our cells, there is a cell membrane potential, they call it, or, or a phase angle. Uh, and my background's in electrical engineering, so it kind of comes naturally for me to view the body as an electrical circuit. Um, but yeah, cell membrane potential is effectively, it's measuring the charge between the inside and the outside of the cell. Every single cell has it. So there's usually a negative charge on the inside of the cell. It's usually between um, 20 and 200 millivolts. Uh, so if we use an average of like 40 um, which is most healthy cells. And it has a negative charge on the inside, positive charge on the outside. And then we're made up of 37 trillion cells. So there's a lot of cell membrane potential or voltage potential with inside of our body. Uh, so it's really important for us to have like a, 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 a powerful charge. And a lot of our cellular biology at the moment is operating independently from each other. So those those millivolts or that charge doesn't get the opportunity to kind of accumulate. However, when we take some of these substances like Ormus or even um, certain kind of salts or in particular gold, which is superconductive material in electrical circuits, so if it's bioavailable oh, right. gold in our circuitry... Right, I'm thinking about like high-end... Um audio equipment like if you buy speaker cables and things that always say like gold tips for better conductivity and sound there's there's something to that in the world of electronics like there's always an emphasis on things being gold plated and things like that all electronics Interesting. phones computers anywhere where there's a very critical area they'll still use gold because what that's doing is removing resistance in the circuit and so that's what it's doing in our body as well. It's removing resistance. It's making things super conductive, which gives those cells that voltage the chance to accumulate and raises the charge and the voltage of our body. Uh, and it also has the capacity to absorb those light waves when it's in that nano size. So uh, it's literally like the highest frequency nutrient we can absorb in our body and it's literally food for our light body. Wow. Yeah. That's so epic. So when you create something like mana gold and it has actual gold in it, 
how is it not five hundred dollars a packet? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, like I uh, I had these earrings that I bought in Hawaii a lot of twenty years ago or something, and um, and finally after maybe twenty years, one of them fell out and I lost it. Mm. And so I just forgot about it. And I thought, you know what? I still have the one. So I took it to a jewelry store here and was like, hey, can you guys match this other earring and, and make me one? And I don't know how you know, how big is like a tiny little hoop earring. And it was like, I don't know, six or $800 for one of them, you know? And they're like, yeah, that's the price of gold. I mean, I think it was even cost. They're like, I wouldn't reckon to charge you for making it just for the gold, you know? I was like, holy shit. So is is there such a small amount of gold that's needed to produce the effect that you describe that it's not like buying a piece of jewelry or something yeah it is quite expensive um obviously. i guess i don't know the price of yeah. it yet. <laughs> maybe it's not 500 dollars. like so the regular mana which we'll do a review of for people that missed the first episode um i i think it's is it like 100 bucks for the the big pack or something i Correct. forget okay yes so for contrast what's the gold gonna be 300. Oh, okay. So it is. I was yeah. like, I'm like, I thought I was way overshooting at 500. So each sachet has five milligrams of pure 24 karat gold in it. Wow. In a nanometer form. Um, we actually did our first bulk production last Thursday. And I literally put half a million dollars worth of gold into a 200,000 sachet run. Whoa. Yeah. No wonder you're not flying first class. <laughs> now I get it. Before I was like, dude, I mean, you could carve out a couple extra grand. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So we're literally reinvesting all of our revenue back into this product. And uh, it, it, we're running mana as a not-for-profit. Oh, okay. Simply because of that. And we hope that a lot of other people do this as well we also hope that some of the new technologies coming through can drive the price of gold down uh and we're involved in a couple of those technologies quite intimately where they're right on the cusp of being able to get monoatomic forms of gold and cluster it which is what nature does over tens of thousands of years when i say cluster it it puts it into sizes that our technology picks up as gold and then we can cluster it even further into the yellow gold that we're familiar with. But nature takes a long time to do that. Now there's some technologies that can do that in days. So that would actually lower the price of gold very significantly because the monoatomic forms of gold is super abundant. It's everywhere. But with gold being the greatest storage of wealth on the planet for the last 5,000 years, it's a big deal to kind of start to change with that, start to change that and alter that. Uh, so it's obviously linked in with consciousness and the part of the cycle that we're in. Um, and there may be resistance to that from particular people as well. So it's quite a sensitive area. And at least at Mana, we actually have the product in the market and available now. And we just feel like we're stewards for that. We feel super proud that we've got to this point because understanding how consciousness works, now that we've done it, hopefully a lot of other people will do it. And what excites us the most is the impact that it does have on the body of being able to pass through the blood brain barrier, get into the amygdala and totally transform the human physiology into like a, a state of genetic liberation and creating a whole new human species. So, <laughs> Oh, just that. <laughs> yeah. Dude, that's incredible. Wow. Yeah. I mean, as you talk about gold and, you know, going back as our, primary measure of value over the past 5,000 years or however long it's been. Um, I've always found it interesting that humans all over the planet have revered gold as much as mm. they do. And one could say on a surface level, oh, well, you know, it's kind of difficult to find and mine and refine and turn into something that you can carry around as a commodity. <laughs> so there's maybe some of that as probably easier than diamonds, for example, but maybe a little harder than silver. So you kind of see why it sits in the middle there. But I've always felt intuitively that there's some other significance to mm. gold. Like, why is that the thing of all things through all of these different cultures throughout history? There's, there's something more to it than just like, oh, we can use this as a bartering tool. Um, so maybe other um, cultures have been aware of some of the, the higher 
um, consciousness elements that you speak to. Totally. Yeah. I think there's things about gold that we're still figuring out as our consciousness changes. We'll learn more about it. I think it has different light waves and different magnetic properties that we're attracted to outside of its shininess and its value. And I think one of the most amazing things about it is it is this incredible food for the light body and for aspects of us that uh, are just starting to get turned back on um, and present themselves, which is, um, you know, there's a lot of research on ancient, ancient civilizations eating gold. There's a lot of research on advanced beings coming to the planet uh, for gold. Um, I don't know if you've seen any of the work of Michael Tellinger, but he's researched that quite passionately and found some very interesting um, research and examples of that throughout South Africa and all across the world. So yeah, gold is, it's the most revered element of all of them. And I think it goes much beyond what we currently know. So cool. Yeah. The idea of eating a metal, I think is probably foreign to some people, mm. um, especially people that are kind of on the cutting edge of health and biohacking because we're starting to learn how detrimental the accumulation of metals is in the body, heavy metals, lead, cadmium, mercury, and so on. Um, one of the companies I work with called Silver Biotics uh, found a way to formulate their colloidal silver so that it doesn't bioaccumulate in the, in the body. And they've done mm -hmm. testing to show that it's gone in 48 hours or whatever it is, which I think is interesting. But I have had messages from people like, ooh, I don't want to take silver because I don't want to be full of heavy metals. And I've worked on detoxing heavy metals for a long time. So I think many of us just have uh, kind of an intuitive aversion to putting mm. metal in our body. But I think maybe there's something different with this from what you said earlier with it, A, doesn't bioaccumulate because of the way that it is metabolized. Um, and not all metals are created equally, right? So what you're describing is this bioluminescence and things like that. Like we don't get that from a lead or a mercury, right? No, not at all. It's very specific to gold. And yeah, you're exactly right. Like even gold, it is a heavy metal. So if you were just to take normal parts of gold, it wouldn't be bioavailable bio and it wouldn't be good for you. But again, breaking it down into these nano size particles, it's 100% bioavailable and can be processed and utilized by the body very efficiently. And again, it is in mainstream uh, science. So even if you're to Google bioavailability of nanoparticle gold, they will admit that the body can really? absorb it and process even it. Even censored yeah. Google? Yeah. Sometimes I'll look things up and I'm like, I know it's going to lie to me. You know, but I'm just like, <laughs> I'm just going to test it out or doing like AI. I'll go on chat GPT and like, oh, hey, what do you think about this or that? And it's like, I know if I cross certain boundaries, it will spit back pseudoscience and just complete like mm. fallacies to me because there's someone behind the scenes controlling the flow of information that doesn't want me to know that <laughs> or wants to paint a different narrative for me. So that's yeah, interesting I, that you can, you can kind of break through the firewall with gold that even mainstream will admit like, oh yeah, it does this and does that. And I think it's because it's being used so much in medicine. So that actually having it going into cells that are incoherent and they're putting specific waveforms of light into the nanoparticles, which is creating energy in that cell and coherence in that cell which is removing the incoherence. I won't necessarily talk about what kind of cells they are, uh, but it's all there. We can, we can read between the lines. Yeah. We know when cells go rogue, it usually starts with the letter C. Yeah. We can say that. Um, wow, so that's some, all there because they're using it a lot. That's so and it's, interesting. And it's working. <laughs> so as someone who likes to know the way things work and do I do my best to visualize it, but I really like mm going like i would love to go to your manufacturing plant and like watch the process i just geek out on stuff like that but i'm picturing you dropping half a million dollars on gold that is a chunk of metal i'm picturing like a big gold bar you know <laughs> from the u.s mint or whatever um how does what's the process of taking that and making it into something that's actually edible and bioavailable yeah, so there's an antiqual process and then there's a, a modern day lab process and and we use both. So there's still a component of it that's done by hand, um, especially grinding the gold down into very thin sheaths 
and then melting that gold uh, and putting it through like a death and resurrection process. We call it a calcineration process. And the power of that being done with like yantras and mantras is it's in training the gold to be self-sustainable. So when it goes into the biology, it's also in training the cells to be self-sustainable. Uh, so that's just something that um, part of the process that we love, but the rest of it is utilizing technology to get the gold particles into the right size, the right geometry, and also have the correct charge because that's the critical component to them being bioavailable as well. So there, there's going to be a number of people that see the value in something like Monogold mm. and will find a way to drop 300 bucks on it. Mm. If somebody was being conservative and they're like, wow, $300 is half my rent or whatever, mm. uh, that's, that's a lot of money. What would be kind of the minimum effective dose in terms of, I mean, could you take one a month and derive benefit or is it something that you'd, if you could afford to, that you take once a week or daily, like give me the range of application based on budget? Yeah, it's a great question. And the way we've designed our other products is there's 30 sachets in a box. So you take one sachet a day, which in this case would cost you $10 a day because the sachet is 10 or $11. So so we you could quit Starbucks and afford it, <laughs> most people. So we understand that's super expensive. Uh, at this stage, there's nothing we can do about that because of the cost of the gold that's in there. Gold's roughly $75,000 a kilo at the moment. And then to actually get it into this nanoparticle form is very, very, very expensive. Uh, so it's been a, a labor of love. And to answer your question... So we're not going to have a subscription model with this. It will be kind of limited to how much we can just produce with inside uh, the project. Uh, we're not raising any capital to do this. It's all funded through MANA. And so you could add one sachet to uh, like a litre of water, which I think for you guys is maybe 64 ounces. Something, something like that. Something like that. Yeah. Um, and you could drink it over a month. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So the five milligrams of nano gold that's in every sachet is literally trillions and trillions and trillions of gold nanoparticles. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So five milligrams to, to give you the correct number, it's actually 10 to the power of 13. So that's one with 13 zeros after it, that's how many nanoparticles are actually in there. So even though we recommend a dosage of five milligrams a day, if you were just to put one sachet in 64 ounces of water and drink it over a month, you would still be getting those nanoparticles going through the blood-brain barrier. And the beautiful thing with it passing through the blood-brain barrier and getting, to, getting into your system is it gets through to the amygdala and that's where all of our emotions and our fear and flight and fight response is. Fucking amygdala. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've been trying to calm that thing down for 30 years. Yeah. Well, this is, this is why I'm so passionate about the product and people even just getting small amounts in there is it starts to alleviate a lot of that emotion, a lot of that fear and balances it out. So that's the first thing that the gold's doing. It's giving us that solid foundation really of like peace and groundedness. And then it can start to regulate those higher processes. So it'll start to get into the cerebral spinal fluid. It'll start to get into the uh, medulla oblongata can actually. So that's the, that's the part of the brain that's regulating like our bodily functions, like our heartbeat, our blood pressure. And so... Um, once we have a certain quotient of light within the body, it will actually start to regulate those secretions up and down the spinal column as well. Uh, and that's when our interaction with life starts to really transform. So epic. We all know electromagnetic pollution is bad, but it's important to understand why. The evidence suggests that the majority of the harm from EMF comes from the chronic oxidative stress produced when the body's in a constant immune response. 
Basically, when we're faced with 3G, 4G, and 5G radiation and beyond, the body is continuously trying to attack whatever it perceives as a foreign invader. Now, unless you're prepared to live in a cave in the Himalayas, it's unlikely you're going to be able to avoid the onslaught of EMF in your life. But what if you could mitigate that immune response and thereby reduce the harm? Well, thankfully, there's a way to live in more harmony with our technological world, and it's called Blue Shield. It turns out, if there are harmonious frequencies in our environment that match or exceed the power of the incoherent frequencies, our body will prefer and attune to the healthy ones through a process called sympathetic resonance. The Blue Shield devices emit these frequencies using a mathematical algorithm that mimics nature so the body can attune to them rather than the dangerous EMF and feel safe. And when we tune into the Blue Shield scalar wave frequencies, our bodies no longer perceive the non-native EMF as a threat and our immune system begins to restore itself and our bodies can finally rest and heal. To create your own EMF strategy, visit blueshield-us.com and use the code LUKE to save 10%. Since I've been using the Blue Shield devices, which is, God, coming on probably six or seven years by now, my energy levels have bounced back, I experience better sleep, less stress, and an overall sense of well-being. I really, really believe in what these guys are doing. So if you want to check it out, go to blueshield-us.com. There's no E in there. It's just B-L-U. And again, the code is Luke to save yourself a fat 10%. What about the implications of stacking sun bathing red light therapy and so on of course i'm always like that's nice how do we maximize it you know but i mean if you're if you're getting that photoreactive effect and that the capacity to um conduct electricity in the cell and to interact with photons seems it would make sense to you know take your monogold dose and go out and get some safe sun exposure depending on you know how much melanin you have i guess safe is um subjective to each person i can handle a lot of sun i go out in the texas sun i could sit there all day i don't get sunburned some people do um but say like a red light bed or getting out in the sun i mean is there any evidence anecdotal or scientifically that would speak to uh, kind of um potentiating the effects of having gold in your system yeah absolutely and it's um i, I guess the first thing is because so with any substance there's three way, main ways for us to ingest it we can um ingest it through the gut we can inject it or we can inhale it so this is giving us or you can uh keister it through <laughs> People that have done time in prison will know what that means. You guys look it up. <laughs> However, this gives us a, a way of ingesting things through that blood-brain barrier, like I mentioned. So um, with the shilajit in mana gold, as an example, it amplifies the effect of the shilajit 10 to 100 times from the research that we're doing. Because once it can go through that chamber, it gets into the central nervous system and that goes out to the cellular receptors, cell cellular receptor network. So it's like a, a greater upregulation of any of those um, other micronutrients that we're taking. Once the gold gets into the central nervous system or into the spinal column, then we can use things like the Christ breath, we can work with sunlight, back to your question about different kinds of light, and we can start to move those fluids up and down that column um, and into different parts of our brain. So like an organic process of uh, purification is um, when the pineal gland will actually start to open up and secrete a substance called amrita. And when that comes up and down that spinal column, down to the sacrum. You can bring it back up if you don't actually um, use that or like if you hold that seed and you don't um, dispel it, then you can bring it back up and utilize it in the brain and utilize it in that central nervous system going back all through the body. So to take the gold with other micronutrients, to work with it with light or other purification methods, you know, beautiful spring water, sun gazing, shilajit, ocean plasma, uh, all of that is like a purification process. Again, it's going to be 
raising the biochemistry in the body, raising like the, the software of our system, if you will, um, which is really important for this time that we're in so that you can receive those codes that are coming in from the sun at the moment and utilize them in a way that are, that are beneficial and, and peaceful and harmonious because otherwise, um, you know, it can be really challenging and will continue to become more challenging as those codes are coming through because they're bringing stuff up that has to come out for us to be able to stay here. And so this is a way of being able to integrate that in a more harmonious way. What's the deal with the humic and fulvic acid in shilajit and its ability to penetrate the cells and get nutrients in and toxins out. Mm. And I ask that because I've heard that. Mm. <laughs> it's just one of the, if someone said it on the show probably, and I'm like, oh, I logged that in, you know, and it sounded true. I don't know if I looked it up, but subjectively I have experienced on a couple of occasions where I've taken your first mana product, which is like a gram of shilaji, which for yes. anyone listening, that's a shit ton of shilaji. I mean, if you take the little pills, like my friend Matt at MitoLife, he has like little uh, little tablets, you know, and I think you, you'd have to take quite a few of them to get a gram, you know, they're convenient though. Um, but yours obviously has some other special sauce in it. But knowing that, I've experimented a couple of times taking what I thought was a microdose of mushrooms with your mana product. <laughs> And it was like that uh, classic meme, these edibles ain't shit, you know, and you're like having visuals. <laughs> um, so word to the wise warning, it is really true. If you take like, a, especially a psychoactive substance with Shilaji, especially yours and that much, it definitely unequivocally potentiates the effects of that. And so I heard that, tried it out, proved it to be true <laughs> you know, for myself. And I'm imagining it's true as you described for the gold, or if you were to mix like your mana product with any other sort of, you know, supplement or something like that. Um, can you talk to us about your understanding of how that those acids react uh, and, and, and interface with our cells? Yeah, absolutely. So you're right. A thousand milligrams of shilajit is a very high dose, a very generous dose, and the shilajit that we get which is a pure resin from above 16,000 feet, has a really high fulvic acid content as well. Um, some of our lab results show it to be 88%, but it's always higher than 44. And a lot of shilajits are between like 7 and 20. Really? Yeah. Uh, and Not a lot to of mention a lot of them are contaminated with heavy metal, mold, all kinds of weird yeah. shit, and they're not tested. When I, I used to buy it uh, from a vendor on Etsy from Siberia, and I would check for the the lab, you know, the lab test, and they show their lab tests. Oh, the heavy metals are safe. There's no mold or fungus or any of that. But they could be faking that too. You know, it's <laughs> like I thought about it after using it for a couple of years, and I was like, well, there's, I could make that on Photoshop. You know, mm. I mean, I wouldn't think it from like a company like you that's you know regulated and stuff. But if you're buying something off Etsy from like some witch in the Siberian mountains, who knows if it's legit? So anyway. Yeah, it's, it's important to lab test it. Everything shows up in there. Um, and fulvic acid's a really good marker. So back to your point, we've got a generous dose. We've got a high percentage of fulvic acid. And then one of the beautiful things with fulvic acid, it's actually known as nature's miracle molecule. There's a really good website actually called fulvicacid.org. And it's got like a hundred different things that it, that it uh, helps with. And some of them are again, pretty, pretty profound. There's clinical studies in there. There's research from doctors. It's really amazing. Um, and a lot of it is around its adaptogen qualities. So it makes other vitamin and mineral preparations other, easier to absorb. Um, it also amplifies them. It also increases I can that, verify that cell membrane potential. And then again, now with the gold, being able to get that fulvic acid that's in the shilajit through the blood-brain barrier, it's amplifying it even more. So um, yeah, fulvic acid, I think, is one of the most powerful super cell conductors that there is full stop. Um, it's kind of just like a lost, it's almost like a lost cell or a lost um, nutrient because 
it's no longer in the soil anymore from like agricultural um, and commercial farming over the last several decades. It's really, it's because it's meant to be in there with the compost and the mycelium and all of that, but it's just, right. if you test it, it's, it's gone. Um, how did you discover the, your source for Shilajit <laughs> that high? What would you, 16,000 feet? Is that what you said? Did yeah. I get that right? Yeah. I didn't like, even know there were land masses that went that high. So I'm like, <laughs> okay, where the fuck is that? <laughs> but I remember in our last conversation, you, you kind of gave me a tale of, you know, a very Indiana Jones kind of like mm. superfood, mm. super nutrient hunter kind of life, um, which I found really interesting. And now I forget the details, but, mm. you know, how many, I don't know, sources did you try to vet or find mm. to get the purity and, you know, lack of contaminants and also that really crazy level of uh, humic acid. Yeah, so initially I was introduced to Shilajit at Mount Kailash. Mount Kailash is the most revered mountain on the planet for the Hindu and Buddhist religion. Uh, they believe it's the home of Shiva. And um, there's a pilgrimage you can do where you walk around the mountain for um, three days, it took me four days. Um, and it's at high altitude and that's where I was introduced to Shilajit. It's really good when you're at high altitude to help with altitude sickness as well. Um, and I was using that as a supply about 10 years ago and selling that into the market just in little glass jars. Um, and that was from a descendant of the royal family of Tibet. His lease and capacity to supply was quite small. Um, so I ended up testing about 20 different kinds of Shilajit through 2018 and 2019. And that's when I feel like I, I kind of became an expert in understanding the different kinds of Shilajit and how the altitudes and regions affected the nutrient content. And so now we get our Shilajit from the Himalayan mountains and also some, some locations in Siberia where it's above that 16,000 feet, mainly because the fulvic acid content is really high and there's no heavy metal. So it's almost like nature goes through this natural fil filtration process of removing the nasties and the concentration process of like improving the nutrient content. Um, so yeah, we're super specific and don't compromise on quality at Mana. That's our biggest thing, um, whether it's the ocean plasma or the shilajit or the gold it's like and that's why we run it as a not-for-profit is it just allows to, us to keep those product costs so high whereas anybody else that came into the business would be like you know what are you doing this doesn't make any sense but they're the most powerful three substances i've found for our human biology and so just having the absolute best sources we can find of those i know that that will be inductive enough for us to be able to sell what we can supply because we we can't get access to massive supplies it's a fairly boutique product because of the way we do it um but it just means we can stand behind it with full integrity and share the absolute best that we've found with whomever it resonates with do we know where sheila g comes from i've heard different things that it is uh, on the kind of um more logical side that it's ancient decomposed plant matter that's mm. kind of concentrated those minerals and nutrients. But I've also heard people say that it could be it could be inclusive of bat dung, uh, <laughs> uh, ancient decomposed animal parts. Have you, I mean, where does it come from? Because for those listening that are unfamiliar with shilajit, I mean, basically it's like a black tar that kind of seeps out from between these rocks in the mountains. Is that like a basic description of how it sort of appears in our world? Correct. Yeah. It's hundred percent plant-based. So it doesn't have, there's no decomposed dinosaurs. Or, actually, I don't even think dinosaurs are real at this point, but that's another conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, I just learned recently, I think that's another one of the many psyops, you know, fossil fuels and all this stuff. But so it's, it's, it, is there any possibility of ancient bat dung in there? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's hundred percent plant based. Okay. So, okay. And, and I wouldn't be mad at that, by the way, as long as it didn't have any, you know, creepy crawlies in totally, it. Totally, yeah, totally. And I don't have any problem with, um, uh, like animal based products, um, but it is plant based product. It, it's maybe people think that because it's so high in protein and amino acids, 
It's literally the most concentrated form of nutrients that I've found. Like it has full spectrum amino acids. It has full spectrum vitamin Bs. It's like 32% protein. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So weird. It has all of the minerals. It's full of magnesium, potassium, sulfur, calcium. Um, It's full of triterpenes, which is the protective compounds in mushrooms. It's full of enzymes. So it's it's literally a superfood that you could live off. Well, people, of course, ask me because I have these cabinets. I mean, I'm so grateful to be in the business of men. People send me stuff all the time. Mm. It's awesome. Mm. I used to spend all of my disposable income on supplements and superfoods and stuff that I couldn't even afford. I would like put shit on my credit card and end up in debt just because I had to try this Sheila gene or something. You know? So I'm very grateful. I'm not complaining, but sometimes it gets a little overwhelming and I'm mm. like, I, you know, I don't know. There's like a cabinet full of stuff. I don't want to overwhelm my body with too many different things at once. Um, so people often ask me as being kind of a supplement fanatic, if I could only pick one thing, what would it be? <laughs> really difficult to say that so i did make a video a couple years ago of like my top 10 non-negotiable things um and she legit was definitely in there but i think and i'm not just saying this because you're here but i think if somebody imposed a rule on me and emptied all my cabinets out and was like you can only have one substance that isn't just food like you know i'd probably pick liver or something like that if it was just one food but like in the supplement realm I gotta say, I think it would be Shilajit mm. for the reasons you just described. I mean, there's just nothing else that nature makes that is that potent mm. and has that level of nutrient density. And especially something that's completely organic and just made by the planet and isn't you know, synthesized in a lab or something like that to be so concentrated. It's literally just the way it is at 16,000 feet. Somebody goes up and digs in the rocks and finds this tar and you eat it and it has all the things you just described. It's fascinating to me. Yeah, it's the same for me as well. It's, it's If there was one thing that I had to be left with and that I could eat to survive, I would choose shilajit as well. And I'd even put it out there that if there is something with like more nutrients in it per gram, I'd love to know about it genuinely. I wonder how it stacks up against uh, oysters, you know, in the food realm. So what, from what I understand in the hierarchy of foods and nutrient density, you have oysters, number one, number two, uh, you know, ruminant or bovine liver, deer liver, mm. elk, cow liver, mm. whatever. That's mm. that's what I've heard. I mean, from a number of different people that seem to be smart and knowledgeable. I wonder how Shilajit stacks up against oysters. Yeah, I mean, the thing that comes to mind straight away is it wouldn't have oysters wouldn't have fulvic acid definitely not so again with all of those other nutrients that are in the shilajit the fulvic acids amplifying them and allowing them to get into the cell through that adaptogen qualities that we spoke about in a unique way and i'd be surprised if the oysters have like the triterpenes or um even the amino acids they may have like 10 or 12, uh, and they'd obviously have the minerals. Um, but I don't know if that'd be as concentrated. It's almost like, I feel like Shilajit would be, if you could get 100 oysters and squeeze them into one gram of substance, <laughs> right, right. that's what nature's done with Shilajit. Right. And then you could add, you know, like 50% fulvic acid, uh, then you'd probably be pretty close yeah oysters don't travel very well either <laughs> <laughs> that's one thing when i first found your uh mana product i was like thank god somebody made like a portable sheila g um because the thing is is like w with those like tubs of it a these people are like criminal because when i used to buy it on etsy i mean it was like 50 dollars for a kilo or something right and it just came in this little plastic tub and then I go to Erwan and it's like $180 for a tiny couple grams, you know? And I was just like, people are shysters. So heads up, <laughs> really, it's the Shilaji like market is very mm, shady in terms of like how much people are marking it up. Um, but the thing is, I'd buy these tubs and even in the little canisters, it's like if it's hot where you store it, then it turns into like this tar and it's like impossible to dose it, right? Mm. It gets all over everything. It's like stringy, like, crude oil kind of right and then if it's too cold then you have to like chip it with a freaking screwdriver it's actually just really hard to to use it mm. 
Um, so as I said, some people make little tablets, which is convenient, but then you have to take so many of them and it ends up also being expensive. So what I liked about yours and like about it still is in the little, um, what do you call it? Like a little ampule or sachet. That's well, it. A little sachet and you just like bend it, squirt it in a drink or just right in your mouth. And I, I keep them in my airplane bag. I mean, it's like every time I travel, I'm like pounding those things on the airplane. And so that's another innovation i think that you nailed is actually making it into more of a liquid so that you can like properly dose it and make it portable too yeah thanks for recognizing that because we've spent a lot of time and energy in finding a way to deliver it in a in a way that tastes better and is also easy to use um we're actually in r d for five years with that sachet machine really yeah to get it right it's <laughs> oh, super advanced mechanical engineering i'll show you a video of how oh it works it'll blow your mind so and for those listening what what we're describing is um and for those watching the video you can see it right but it's like a little little packet that's like i don't know a little smaller than a credit card and then you just bend it in half and there's like a little perforated uh slit here right you just and then you kind of just squeeze it out and make sure you don't waste any i squeeze mine like 10 times to make sure i get every little drop out of there but when you look at something like this you don't think like oh i bet that was hard to do you're just th i'm just thinking oh cool somebody figured out a way to make sheila jean like more practical to use you know so five years of that yeah so the trick is so that's actually a top and a bottom layer to that and the liquid has to get in between that top and bottom layer with the four side sealing uh, right. and without it leaking. Because oh if it God. leaks when that's happening, then it goes all through the rollers in the machine and all over the polymer, oh, the right. top and bottom. So yeah, anyway, it's super, it's super advanced. It's very boutique. There's nobody else that has those kind of sachets. And um, yeah, it's, it's, there's there's times where we've kind of wanted to give up on that however we're aware of the challenges that you spoke about with shilajit and you know to have these sachets in your kitchen just saves you so much time and is so easy to use and then you can travel with them and do all of those different things so we've stuck with it um we've got it right and um yeah it's super exciting to be able to deliver the correct dosage in a way that is um, easy and saves our saves our customers time. So I take one little mono packet a day. Is that like would more? Is there like a law of diminishing returns kind of thing? Like if I did three a day, would it be overkill and be a waste of money? Or is one a day like a pretty good maintenance dose for general health? Yeah, one a day is enough. As we said before, like a thousand milligrams of pure shilajit res resin is a lot. The only reason it's a liquid inside those sachets is because we're adding it to the ocean plasma. So a thousand milligrams of ocean plasma. And then um, we've got an Ayurvedic professor of 50 years that has shared like his chai formula with us. And chai actually negates that really strong flavor of the shilajit. It's the combination of the cardamom, the nutmeg, the ginger. And then we have the cinnamon and the vanilla and the clove to kind of give it that kinder flavor profile because nutmeg and vanilla is kind of, if there's too much of that, it be, can be quite soapy. Um, but that's the only reason it's in a liquid form. Um, I'll show you after the podcast because we just did the manufacturing, the latest run last week, and the blocks of resin that we put into our manufacturing uh, kettle, um, they're like the blackest, most shiniest thing you've ever seen. They come in 100 gram blocks from the Himalayas and they're like concrete. <laughs> wow. Um, so we put them in the mix with the ocean plasma. We do it at low temperature so it maintains all of those enzymes and triterpenes. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a labor of love. It's a super expensive process to go through. Um, but again, we know that's the actually best form of those substances in the market. And that's something that we su feel super passionate about in an industry that, um, you know, has so many other versions of products that um, are just there to make a profit or, you know, they're getting them in powders forms, powdered forms with other fillers, or they're coming from places where there's basically no life force left in the substances themselves. So um, 
yeah, we feel really good about being able to get the best quality substances into those little sachets and have them in people's kitchen um, in a way that can they can access that nature, the best of nature, in an easy um, way that can save them time. And save them from hiking 16,000 <laughs> <laughs> Totally. Who's, who's collecting the Sheila Jeet and how do, they, how do they harvest it? Yes. I, I, I'm picturing like little, I don't know, you know, little Sherpas like up there, you know, rock climbing, getting to these little crevices and chipping it out with a hatchet or something. How, like how does that process work? Yeah, it's, it's super intense uh, and especially at that altitude. So last July and August... We employed around 600 people in the Himalayas to go out and collect shilajit resin. Wow. Yeah. At um, the place where we were there was around 17,500 feet. And, um, you know, it's super remote. It's at, at that altitude, it's some of the scaredest I've ever been because monsoons come through and uh, no one's coming to get you. And, when I was up there last time, I, had, I needed to have um, oxygen because I wasn't um, acclimatized. And so I actually went up in a helicopter and we had to do an emergency landing at 17,000 feet, um, which is about the height where the helicopter can sometimes not start again. <laughs> oh, man. And we'd had six days of monsoons, so... Um, you know, the fear was that we mightn't be able to fly for another four or five days and we only kind of had, you know, 24, 48 hours of oxygen. Um, so, yeah, it was a pretty scary experience. Um, but, yeah, so 600 people will literally gather it in hand um, with sacks and then it goes through a filtration process to separate the resin from the dirt and the other things that are um, in the ground to end up with a, a pure black resin. I'd love to see that. I'd like to see the 600 people descend on the mountain and yeah. just start like hunting for it. I picture it just to be a really difficult process, you know, just thinking about how it's kind of stuck up in rocks. And it, it's not just like it's bubbling out like a spring or something and you just go fill it up with a bucket, you know? It's like you've really got to kind of hand mine it is what it sounds like. Yeah, and there's some deposits that will come out and you might see uh, a chunk like, the size of a baseball, like the biggest one I've ever seen was probably about the size of a gridiron. Um, but most of the time it's just small amounts in with all of the rock and the dirt. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and yeah, Shilajit is super interesting because now they're mining it like at 1,000 feet in countries like Somalia because it is, uh, you can buy Shilajit anything from like $20 a kilo up to two thousand dollars a kilo. That's how much the market is kind of changed for it. And you know, twenty dollars a kilo, a powder in China, buy it per ton, and you know, it might actually have like one or two percent fulvic acid, and you don't know what else is in it. Um, but yeah, the other higher forms they are much more expensive because it's a lot of work to get to them. And you can only access them for about eight or 10 weeks of the year. Is it uh, renewable or do you see a time when enough humans catch on to how <laughs> amazing Shilajit is and it's all gone? Yeah, no, the, the ranges where it exists are massive. Um, so even though it's coming out of those high altitudes, the Himalayan mountain range is, is massive. Um, it's available in Kashmir and Mongolia as well. The Altai range in Mongolia is massive and then up through Tibet into China, and then up through Russia and Siberia. So often I'll say to people like, those mountain ranges alone is like going from LA to New York and back. Oh, wow. It's a serious, massive land. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so there's a lot of abundance. Like we wouldn't have even touched 0.001% of Shilajit amongst wow. all the companies that are selling it. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I wonder what, you know, you look at, people like Graham Hancock, right, that are kind of giving you this alternate view of archaeology and things like that. Mm. I wonder what the truth is about however many thousands or millions of years ago was 
was the top of those mountains the bottom of a sea <laughs> and this is ancient seaweed or you know what i mean it's like i wish i could go back in time and just see what was happening like what were all those plants growing on before they became shilajit over thousands of years of you know getting compacted and however that that happens it's so interesting do you have any knowledge like what at least what the um commonly held belief is about like what that mountain range was and how did those freaking plants get up there because you're talking about a, above timberline there's not enough oxygen for plants to grow up there mm. but at some point there was because mm. that's where the shilajit came from yeah not sure i mean i know in the middle of australia there's opalized cockles which means um like it was under the ocean at some point in the center of australia that would be like saying um denver was under the ocean so it's hard to tell what different cycles the earth's been through um but at that high altitude the plants that the shilajit may is made from and and my best guess would be like it's that kind of cactus world um they're exposed to such ex extreme environmental conditions that they take on and develop a lot of protective um compounds to be able to exist in those locations where there's extreme extreme um, pressure or extreme temperatures like freezing temperatures um, and i think that's one of the big reasons why shilajit has a lot of those biogenetic stimulant qualities is because when we're able to extract and ingest those um, compounds then our body also receives um, those protective compounds that the plants have been developing potentially over hundreds and thousands of years. Hence the name mana vitality. Yeah. It reminds me of uh, goji berries, you know, like yeah. we have the shilajit, I think is more uh, historically relevant to the Ayurvedic system. Right? Yes. And then goji berries more in Chinese medicine. And I've heard that about goji berries, that their nutrient density is is in part because they have to survive such extreme mm. weather conditions. I think that that's an interesting way to look at things, you know? So mm. it's like, you want to go into nature and eat the most resilient living beings to give yourself the most resilience. I wonder if that's true of oysters. <laughs> I don't know what their life is like. Uh, I want to let people know if you want to check out mana, we've got a 20% off code here. So if you go to lukestory.com slash mana, M-A-N-N-A, -N -N your code there is Luke 20. And by the time this conversation goes live, the gold will be available too. Because it's about to be available at the end of this month and this will be out in a few weeks. Uh, also, I forgot to mention before, the show notes in general for anything we link here will be found at lukestory.com slash mana2, the number two. I recently signed up for this subscription service called Quantum Upgrade, and it's been a major game changer for my energy, EMF resilience, and the overall feeling in our home. Let me explain how it works. Quantum energy is the energy that supports all life in the universe. It's non-linear, non-local, and has an immense potential for health when it's harnessed and directed to you or into your living environment. Through many years of research and development, Quantum Upgrade created one of the world's most potent sources of usable quantum energy. So when you sign up for their service, Quantum Upgrade associates your home, car, phone, business, and even your pet with this energy. The energy you receive with the Quantum Upgrade is a high consciousness field that you can even customize on the fly. For example, I like to set different booster levels at specific times such as before a podcast recording or during sleep. It's pretty awesome. The Quantum Upgrade Energy Streaming Service has already been studied and tested by independent institutes, doctors, and labs with phenomenal results in placebo-controlled double-blind studies. It's been shown to improve red and white blood cells and even reverse stages 1 and 2 of blood clotting in only a few minutes. You can try it right now risk-free with a 15-day free trial by visiting quantumupgrade.io. All you got to do is use the code LUKE15 to activate your free trial. Again, you'll find it at quantumupgrade.io. There's so many things I want to talk to you about. Let's talk about the uh the sea mineral solution and ormus i remember mm -hmm. I don't, many years ago when i got into all this stuff ormus was like a really big kind of uh trend and 
I heard things like, oh, they're um, minerals that exist outside of the periodic table that have mm -hmm. been kind of censored or removed from our knowledge base and that they're subatomic. And the, the Ormus just had this kind of allure about it. And there were some products that came out here and there and it supposedly was Ormus, like little liquid dropper bottles and stuff. And I'd buy them from time to time. And I never really understood what it is um mm -hmm. and it's one of those things that i just kind of chalked up to me and it's just like a marketing word and it's not a real thing so eventually i just kind of lost interest in it because i could never figure out what the hell it meant so from your experience i guess that's two questions one is the sea minerals you know the sea plasma and then how that relates to ormus and what ormus actually is uh from mm. for your understanding yeah it's a really good question and um the ocean plasma i might just start with that first okay. so cool that's a, a hypertonic solution that we get from the Dead Sea, 50%. And then we also get it from down off Tasmania and put it through a three-year solar evaporation process to adjust those mineral ratios. Um, so basically, we're just lifting the magnesium, potassium, calcium, sulfur component, and then reducing the sodium chloride and allowing all of those other trace minerals uh, to come into effect. That takes three years. Yeah. <laughs> So if you just went and, you know, drank some water out of the Dead Sea, the, the sodium content would be too high. So to get like the concentration you'd want of those other minerals would be impossible because you'd be overloading yourself with sodium, basically. Is that why it takes three years? No, so sorry. So, so the water that we get from down off Tasmania, that's traditional seawater. And that's 95% sodium chloride. So that's the one we're adjusting. Oh, uh, Okay. And the dead sea water actually is a, only about 8% sodium chloride. Oh, really? Yeah. It's actually what? organically really high in those other minerals. Wow. Yeah. So when I- Is when it I crazy slept, high in uh, magnesium? Yes. Like a float tank? I've heard that you can go to the dead sea and just float around like you can in a float tank because of the saturation of minerals in it. Totally. Yeah. So it's about 55, depending on where you get it from, but it's about 55,000 parts per million. Which Holy is shit. which is about the same amount as a magnesium supplement. Wow. But then it's really high in potassium, calcium, sulfur, and chlorides as well. So the beautiful thing with the float tanks over there is you're not just getting like a normal float tank will just be isolated to magnesium or yeah. potassium. Yeah. Whereas it's got all of them, which is wow. super powerful. That's cool. Yeah. So I was fortunate when I slept on the bank over there for for ninety ninety days. Um, that I had access to a laboratory that had just been built in the base of Masada, which is a really famous mountain over there. The one of the big mining companies had literally just built it, and a lot of the a lot of the rooms were vacant. And I befriended the manager and was able to test different deposits of water. And I presumed it would be sodium chloride as well um, in a very high ratio, but it wasn't. It was those other minerals that we just discussed. Um, but reg so it's a very different source solution to any other water I've ever found on the planet. But the actual ocean, the Pacific Ocean and the Tasman Ocean, um, they are 95% sodium chloride. So if you're just drinking that, you're going to overload your kidneys and it won't, you know, it's just too concentrated. You're going to get disaster pants. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you're still having like 30 mils of that a day in a liter of water, it'd be super beneficial for you. And that's basically what, um, ketone, um, ocean plasma is. They've got an isotonic solution and a hypertonic solution, which is 3.3.5%. 3 Beautiful product. Love it. That's based off Renee Quinton's work last century, who is healing all kinds of people through France and Egypt just with normal ocean Dude, water. Did you hear about the experiment he did where he, um, I forget how many dogs it was, at least one where he did a basically a blood transfusion mm. and replaced its blood with the isotonic and it continued living. Yeah. It's fucking crazy, dude. Yeah. I and mean, that's like, sounds not true. You can look it up. It, he really did it. And again, I forget the details of how many dogs it was, but he was experimenting and that's how close those sea minerals are to you know, our own plasma, basically. It's super fascinating. Super fascinating, especially in yeah. that percentage ratio is very similar. So yeah. again, it's, I mean, the blood's really giving us a lot of that electrical charge. Again, back to that electrical circuit, electrical system. So um, 
Yeah, that's what we're doing with the ocean plasma, but in a very, very concentrated form. So the ocean plasma that we use is between 330,000 parts per mi million and 350,000 parts per million. And the reason we stop there with the concentration of it is it starts to solidify if you go more than that. So our holding tank actually has crystals growing in the bottom where it is solidifying. Uh, and it's almost like a plasma in that form. So when we mix that ocean water that goes through a three-year solar evaporation process with the dead sea water we do that with a, a resonant vortex technology that has a rotating magnetic field around that vortex communication chamber and the substance turns white so it's producing a precipitate that we call ormus or mana ah, okay okay however it's debatable whether that is a monoatomic or whether it's a diatomic we kind of pull back from that now because it's like the whole monoatomic world is is very subjective. Um, and what I mean by that is from what we're learning with the nano gold, in nature there's, there's monoatomic gold in uh, all different colors and forms that are still becoming gold, if you will. Like they're particles – looking for additional electrons, deciding what they're going to become. Oh, wow. Yeah. So they haven't fully potentiated yet. Correct. That's interesting. Correct, yeah. And once oh, that- You're into such cool shit, dude. I love this <laughs> stuff. So fascinating. All it's, right, carry on. It's a lot Sorry. of fun. But with the Ormus, yeah. there's, there's a precipitate there. Uh, it looks like it's- elements in other spin rates or elements that our technology doesn't detect yet. So at the moment, we've got 118 elements on the periodic table. Potentially, there's many more. Um, you know, we've found additional ones in the last 100 years that were predicted by scientists like Walter Russell, that instead of having a periodic table that's just a, a 2D chart, he created one that's a spiral, a vortex, and he was able to predict elements that we didn't know about then because he could see the nodal points on that vortex and since then we've discovered some of those and there's still lots more to be discovered from his work fascinating yeah so these elements could be those uh so there's the ocean plasma there's the precipitate which we call ormus and then um yeah i guess does that answer your question like it on, does, yeah, on what yeah. ormus is it it, it's not even clear to me, to be honest, Luke. I know that <laughs> I, there's orbitally rearranged monoatomic elements is what it stands for. I went and stayed with oh, okay. Barry Carter for 10 days back in 2014 to learn more about it. And he was known as like the librarian of Ormus on the planet. Um, he had basically been gathering like a lifetime of work. And he ended up giving me 1.4 terabytes of information at the time Really? Which was everything he had. And it was only wow. a year later that he left his body. And it was the same with David Hudson. He was the guy that was finding this white substance on his farm. And he found that when his crops were exposed to that, they were growing much faster, much healthier, and the yield was, was much higher. So he invested millions of dollars of his own money into finding out what that white powder was but when he was sending it off to get assays initially they were just coming back and saying it's nothing like it it doesn't register in our technology he was saying to them well, what are you talking about like i'm sending you you know a pound of this stuff and you're saying it doesn't exist there's nothing there wow so that's where he spent millions of dollars of his own money trying to figure out what it was because it was having such profound effects on his crops um and then yeah he was um he had a whole bunch of things to happen to him uh, where he pulled away from investigating it any further. So it's kind of always just been this interesting, yeah, yeah. mystical space. Well, were some of the things that happened to him, like, uh, you know, visits from men in black hopping out of black SUVs, <laughs> you know, telling them to, you know how this is? Like when, when you start to, okay, say there's a researcher or someone who's just really curious, right, and starts kind of, 
uh, leaving the known paradigm of science or technology or engineering or whatever it is, thinking of people that come up with free energy devices or, mm. you know, cars that run on water and all of a sudden they start disappearing, mm. you know, mysteriously and things like that. It seems like when we hit a certain threshold of understanding through independent research that it's somewhat common that the powers that be come in and stamp that out because in this case, let's just... Uh, guess maybe they really like the idea of just sticking with the periodic table that we have and you start getting out of that in a way that could really benefit humanity the um, the forces out there that are antithetical to humanity don't want you to do that do you mm. think it had anything to do with that in this particular case potentially i mean one of the stories with david was that he wanted to commercialize it and start producing large volumes and he had everything ready to go and um the factory burnt down so again, hard to say, was that natural right. or was that, um, you know, something nefarious? Uh, I met another gentleman um, that called himself the Essene in uh, Australia, in Melbourne, and he was also setting up a commercialized facility to produce Ormus. And um, yeah, he had millions of dollars worth in huge water tanks. And then someone came in in the middle of the night and cut all of the pipes that released it all out onto the ground, basically. Whoa. Yeah. Do you have any concerns as you start to further develop your understanding and production of Ormus products? Is there, I mean, it's just weird because it's not like, I don't know. It's not like a free energy thing where it's going to compromise an entire uh, substrate of uh, the world economy, right? Mm. If you come up for an al alternative for gasoline, I mean, that's a huge threat to a massive industry, but it seems like, I don't know, who would be pissed off about Ormus that has incredible health benefits like the medical industry? It's not like it's curing diseases that they want to monetize the treatment and management of. It's just yeah, it's weird, you know? It is an interesting one. I think gold and Ormus is often referred to as those precious metals coming through in other spin rates, um, in particular gold. Um, and even with the nano gold, I, f I feel like there is a component that the understanding changes science similar to a, a free energy device. It's like when people turn on very advanced free energy devices, it actually sends neutrinos up into the ionosphere and they can detect that and, and go to the location really quickly. <laughs> right, right. So, yeah, it's and, – and and there's a component of that um, that's not necessarily bad either. It is like a, a national security risk because some of those devices are, you know, some, some of those advanced units of those are like reproducing – a sun, like reproducing a desktop sun or creating a black hole. And some scientists that I know that have built free energy devices that are working off toroidal dynamics and have turned them on, um, you know, they haven't been able to control them and it's really freaked them out. You know, like concrete wall floors start turning to liquid and waving and... Whoa. Um, yeah, so so I feel and probably like, jamming, you know, radar and military infrastructure and things like that, right? Hence, kind of setting up a beacon for the powers that be. Like, what the hell? There's a blip <laughs> on the radar here. Yeah, uh, drive down this country road to some tweaker inventor who's coming up with some device in his garage. You know, I mean, you hear about stuff like this, and th there are situations like that on record where somebody's tinkering and it kind of raises a red flag because they're working with different energies that, you know, I mean, like you said, could potentially just be unsafe. Mm. And in other cases, maybe threaten an existing paradigm or, yeah, you know, something like that, that they, they like things the way they are, you know, it's like this whole thing around, um, you know, like I was kind of clowning on dinosaurs and fossil fuels, yeah. but it seems that the powers that be that um, have amassed wealth and power based on imposing the idea that there's a scarcity around a certain resource, mm. right? Like water, for example, mm. I learned some years ago that there, there's no shortage of water. I mean, not even, I mean, drinking water, there's no shortage of um, salt water. We kind of know that, <laughs> but I learned about primary water and basically 
the planet makes water. And one could argue that all the water on the planet, the 70, 80% or whatever it is of the entire planet, that the water that's here didn't come from outer space, which I don't even think is real anymore either, but that the water is actually being generated by the planet like oil. And so there's all these kind of systems in place that teach us from the moment, you know, we're born our first day in school, that there's these limited resources of water or energy, things like that, that we have to buy electricity. Mm. And then you start going down these rabbit holes on TikTok and you find out, oh <laughs> shit, you know, learn about Tartaria and like, why did all these cathedrals have these cathodes and diodes and, you know, these tubes of mercury that were catching energy from the ethers. And there's like so much information that has mm. been suppressed by the greed of very few people that don't want the masses to know that our universe is more abundant mm. and that has more potential for um, technological advancements and mm. the betterment of the quality of our life experience here. It's just so interesting, you know, how a few people like you slip through the cracks and, you know, oh, you're just making this little supplement over here. <laughs> you know, mm. you'd probably be able to continue on uninterrupted, but if you kind of get into the lane where you're actually mm. going to disrupt an entire system, especially if there's a lot of money behind it, it's, it's dangerous. Mm. Yeah, it's so interesting. Yeah, and I think it's coming. Like, you know, I was talking with someone last night that knows someone in South America who's able to replicate molecules. Really? So that's really cool. Those couple of technologies I mentioned before about being able to cluster monoatomic elements of, or monoatomic, um, yeah, uh, gold atoms. That's super interesting. Um, some of these free energy devices that are coming through. So there's a lot of things sitting there right on the precipice. I feel like as our consciousness keeps changing, the external world being a reflection of our inner state, they will just start presenting and everything has its timing is how I understand it. And, you know, as much as there's a part of all of us that really want those solutions to be here now and end a lot of the challenge and struggling and resistance to life that so many have, I also feel like the journey to get there is really important and from consciousness's perspective that is such a blessing to actually have that journey to go to where we're headed uh, but i do feel that it's going to accelerate super fast now with the assistance of technology and just the new light codes that are coming in and um yeah we're i gonna love get your there. your positivity it's healthy for me to be around people like you because you know i just I just am such a truth seeker, right? And much mm. of the truth out there is is not great news, right? There's like, you can really get swallowed up by the darkness in the world um, because you want to kind of know, right? If you, if you have a curious sort of character, mm. you're going to find the love and light and all the positivity and the great awakening, but you're also going to find the great reset on the other side, mm. you know? Mm. So I'm always trying to find, you know, my balance and lean more into your perspective, which is like, yeah, we're on the precipice of something really amazing and there's amazing developments technologically. Consciousness is elevating and In today's world, where we're expected to be on and connected at all hours, poor sleep has become a real pandemic. But it's not supposed to be this way, y'all, and thankfully, it doesn't have to be. Taking control of your brain is the key, and New Calm helps you be the boss of your brain with their clinically proven neuroscience-backed technology. You can think of New Calm as music with a purpose. Now, what you hear when you listen to it is a symphony of beautiful sound, but at the core of NuCalm is neuroacoustic software that gently guides your brain waves to the deepest levels of sleep, meditation, or even focus or max energy. All you do is just throw on some headphones, open the app, and press play, and NuCalm does the rest. And what's wild is that with their power nap program, you can actually get two hours of restorative sleep in just 20 minutes. I do it all the time and I've been doing it for years. But when I really need a sleep reboot, I'll throw on the deep sleep program and start counting sheep with the quickness. Using patented Delta Wave algorithms, deep sleep supports continuous sleep and helps you return to it if your sleep gets interrupted. It's pretty incredible how it guides your brain into the deepest, most restorative sleep possible and makes sure you wake up truly refreshed and rejuvenated, 
ready to crush the day with vitality and clarity. So you definitely want to check this out. Head over to newcalm.com, that's N-U-C-A-L-M, and sign up for their seven-day free trial. And once you decide to get your subscription, use the code Luke and you're going to save 15% off. I've been using NewCalm to improve my meditation, sleep, focus, and all the things for about five years, so I definitely recommend that you check it out for yourself. And here's a quick travel tip for you. Use NewCalm when you're on the plane, and you will arrive incredibly refreshed. It really works. So again, visit NewCalm, N-U-C-A-L-M dot com, and punch in that code Luke to save 15% off your subscription. I don't know, maybe I'll ask you this. Do you think that the elevation of our collective consciousness has risen and is rising, and that's why the darkness that has persisted for so so many eons here on the planet is starting to come to light? I mean, do you think that's part of why we're all seeing the way things really are that we didn't see before? Yeah, I feel like there's the system, and it's doing its thing, and it's trying to control and be even more centralized. It's kind of like having its final hour and then there's these alternative systems that are being built that have been getting built the whole time and there haven't necessarily been the supportive structures for their sustainability whereas there is now you know there's so many people working on these alternative systems and a lot of them are decentralized so it's much harder to stop them right. within that decentralization right is this transparency and truth that can't be manipulated that is a representation of that pure consciousness you know that that that's coming through and that's the only reason something that so transparent and so honest can exist from my perspective is because of um that consciousness changing so yeah i see both taking place and you know as the current system just become so hard to exist in and and like um such a squeeze for people whether it's financial or or health or whatever it is once there's another system for people to jump into and another structure another net to actually hold them that has a sustainability i think it's quite logical and even common sense that you would jump over right <laughs> you know people don't want to jump into nothing Right, or the total right. unknown. It's it's too right. scary. They'll they'll keep battling, and just surviving, where they feel comfortable and safe. But as soon as this has a bit more uh, stability, and people can feel safe there, I think it. Um, I think you'll just get people like leaving by the. That's a really good point. Yeah, it's like millions. we're we're going to cling to a broken system before we're going to jump into the void of no system. Yeah, <laughs> right. It's like yeah. You know, I think a lot of the issues that we face are rooted in statism, right? We just, we lack autonomy, self-trust. We don't trust one another. So we give our power over to the state in whatever form that shows up. In. And uh, yeah, until that trust and that consciousness reaches a certain level, we're kind of just going to settle for being statist ultimately, right? And yeah. having that kind of mommy and daddy's protection and following their rules and their... Yeah impositions on our freedom because we we need to feel safe even though we're not really safe and <laughs> if you look at the empirical evidence throughout history the 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 entities and um, systems we've gone to for safety have actually been the most deleterious and deadly to humanity and we're i think starting to realize that but i, I like your perspective of what i'm kind of extracting from that is rather than trying to tear this antiquated rapacious system down it's mm. like oh yeah you guys just go do your thing over there and we're just going to keep building these decentralized systems through you know our ability to communicate now i think the internet is really the straw that broke the camel's back on the old dark ages paradigm because even with censorship it's like we're going to find ways to communicate and 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 the interesting thing about that because sometimes i'll think okay if if really the internet was kind of the um you know the um Pandora's box that opened for us, then sometimes we'll think, well, it, they know that's how we're all sharing information and building mm -hmm. these new systems. So they're just going to shut down the internet, but they can't because their entire financial system is also dependent on the internet. <laughs> and there's no way to really stop it for everyone, right? Some hacker somewhere is going to find a way to get through. And we have, a, you know, these cryptocurrencies and 
people are utilizing the internet um, not only to share information, but also to create new systems of commerce and everything else. So it's like, I don't think they can put it back in the bag at this point. It's just, we've gone too far. There's too much information that's out. And I know all the conspiracy theorists out there too, that are really serious about this information. They're saving all this shit on local hard drives. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like the information that we are learning now about suppressed technologies and hidden history and all these kind of things. It's like, even if the internet shuts down, there's hard drives all over the world full of all this stuff. Mm. So it's you, it's not going away. You can't take that data from people's individual servers. It's like, we have it, mm. right? So mm. even if they did go, okay, we're shutting down the World Wide Web for everyone except the upper echelon of the pseudo elite parasite class, we still have the information mm. and we're still gonna find a way to print it out and share it. and. It's, I don't think there's any going back. Mm. Yeah, I agree. You know, which is a positive thing, which again, you know, I'm always like, think positive, Luke, have a positive message here on the <laughs> podcast because there's a lot of darkness out there, man. And it's over the past few years, we've really seen, I mean, you're from freaking Australia, dude. We're sitting here in America going, wow, this is bad. And then we looked at what happened in Australia and Canada, for example, or New Zealand. And we're going like, oh shit, it can actually get worse. Mm. There's like stages between, you know, the United States and China or something or North Korea. And we think, oh, it'll never happen here. And then you see other Western Commonwealth countries getting pretty damn close to the Chinese communism model. Like it's mm. scary. So mm. it's, it's really important to remember like, okay, let's acknowledge that's there and not put our head in the sands. But rather than like, you know, bickering amongst ourselves and falling for the divide and conquer trick or, you know, being paralyzed by fear or resentment or hatred for the system. It's just like, cool, let's create our own. I interviewed a guy recently named George Wiseman, who, um, I don't, he didn't invent Brown's gas, but he's kind of a guy that created devices that make Brown's gas that you inhale or drink. And uh, he's got this really great thing I have in my office called the Aqua True. I'm on that thing literally all day. It's the best ever. And he, um, is an engineer, you know, and um, he came up with these devices that you could put on your car that would, I don't know, quadruple or 10x your gas mileage and kind wow. of in the free energy space and, you know, fuel consumption hacks. And, uh, and I asked him, like, are you ever afraid for your life? Like if you're, you know, letting this information get out and what he shared with me that maybe if any inventors are listening, he said, the key to securing your own personal safety, if you're someone who's breaking paradigms is you just don't patent anything. And so, yeah, he said, if you patent it, that's when the men in black show up at your door and try to kill you or steal your plans or, you know, your, whatever, your blueprints and all this kind of stuff. And he said, yeah, I don't, op I don't patent anything. Everything is open source and you make less money, but you don't get killed. <laughs> you know? So that's a really interesting, you know, another kind of paradigm change mm. right is rather than like oh i'm going to invent this thing and just use it for myself to to enrich myself but to actually just make things open source and decentralized and in so doing yeah you won't make money but you also can keep inventing and he's still coming up with all kinds of stuff tinkering around in his workshop and he's not worried about it at all because he doesn't try to he doesn't try to patent it i love that and i mean that's true service as well 100 percent. yeah yeah, you're creating something. You're sharing how to how to make it, how to do it. That's a yeah. it's a beautiful approach. You can go on his site and download the plans for the machine he sells for twenty five hundred bucks, and just make it yourself. He teaches you how. I think it's I don't know twenty bucks or something to get the blueprints, and then you know you obviously have to be good at building things. Same thing with his fuel saver things; they're free downloads. And if you have that kind of skill, you can just go do it yourself. Yeah, that's really beautiful. You know, and he still found, a, you know, I'm sure he still makes great money selling his machines for people like me that have no interest or talent for, interest in or talent for building one. So I think there's a, there's a lot on the positive side with where we are right now too. Yeah. And I think it's really important to recognize like the system's there, it's running. There's some beautiful people in it. There's some people that may have, you know, alternative ways of still wanting to control or hang on to things that they're doing. However, we don't want to just strip that down without also having those new structures to go into because it it would be chaotic and it wouldn't be a pretty place. The earth wouldn't be a pretty place to be. So I think it's this beautiful period at the moment where there's enough people aware now 
and more people becoming aware every day that there's better ways to do things. And because of the decentralized na nature, people can do things and uh, the information is recorded, whether it's saved on hard drives or saved on a, a blockchain or, or saved in the field. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, those new systems are being built rapidly. There's some brilliant minds, some beautiful people, people building those. And it's just going to be a transfer of energy from the system that's becoming redundant and people aren't resonating with it anymore across to those new open systems. And I think that's a much kinder way for us to transition forward rather than, you know, trying to pull it down. Um, and often as you try and build things yourself, you realize like it's not that easy. Sometimes you've got to compromise on things as well. So, um, yeah, it's also, it requires collaboration. Totally. And community. Yeah. yeah know, totally. There's very few people that can do a thing of substance entirely on their own. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And finding the solutions. Yeah. Cause it's super easy to kind of, you know, start waking up and say, Oh wow, they're doing this with their money or they've done this because of this. It's like, what's the solution for that? Let's focus and build that solution. And putting our attention there is is something really beautiful and beneficial, I believe. Here in the old USA, a positive trend I'm seeing emerge out of the chaos over the past few years is the trend of uh, people living off grid, homesteading, <laughs> uh, building intentional communities, homeschooling, producing yeah. their own food. I mean, I'm watching people on social media do this stuff, and I'm just like, oh my God, I'm so domesticated. I'm so like, <laughs> you know, living in a house in the suburbs, and I'm just like, I'm so dependent on the system. I am not self sufficient at all. It's That's embarrassing. It. Um, and it is what it is. I'm, I'm getting there, you know, I'm making small steps, right? But, um, I think that is something that's really interesting and is another example of, you know, the darkness kind of pushing people out into the light and they're going like, yeah, I'm pulling my kid out of public school because they're getting indoctrinated and brainwashed and I'm growing my own food because everything else is poison and building my own structures that are not uh, full of toxins. And mm. like, there's so much of that going on now. It's a really cool trend. Mm. And I think as more people do it, you know, the micro nations and micro communities that get built around that lower the barrier to entry for someone like me who I don't consider myself very skilled. Like I'm not handy. I don't know how to build shit. I have my talents and my gifts, but they're not really, I don't see how they fit into that. So, you know, as more people do it and they figure it out, then it kind of encourages me like, wow, I don't, I'm not very mechanically inclined, for example, but I'm sure there's some part of it that I'd be good at. And so maybe mm. I could create a community or join a community and be able to contribute something. I don't know, maybe if anyone out there homesteading needs a podcaster, I'm okay at that. <laughs> How are you, uh, are you observing that in Australia? Is that is that an emerging trend there where people are just kind of learning about sovereignty and living off the land and kind of doing their own thing? Yeah, definitely. I, I think back to your point, so many of us are so dependent on the system, almost like addicted to components of the system. And that's where I'm super uh, cautious when I'm observing different people bagging it out. It's like, the only reason it exists in such a thriving way is because we're participating in it so often. And there's so many parts of the system that are pretty convenient. And oh, I'm totally addicted to Amazon. <laughs> Honestly, like when I travel, I'd be like, oh, I need some batteries. I'm going to Amazon. I'm like, I'm in Costa Rica. You can't just order something on Amazon, you know? And even yeah. like in the pandemic, when Amazon was like censoring books and stuff, I was like, I'm going to boycott Amazon. Fuck them. It lasted about a day. You know, and I was like, I need some toilet paper. I'm you know? <laughs> just like, oh God, there, there's a level of commitment to your, you know, your morals that is required too, if you're really going to divorce yourself from the benefits that the broken system has to offer and the multinational corporations. I mean, we really do get addicted to the convenience mm. and the speed with which we can just like get what we want and what mm. we need. It It is like a bit of a, addiction and a, mm. i think there's a detox process that creates you know some resistance there because i have these idealistic ways of how the world should be and how i want to operate in it yet i still participate because i'm so conditioned to do so yeah and it's a transition i think we're definitely transitioning and that's that's the key thing and we kind of don't know how long that transition transition is going to take you know the system could start breaking down 
There could be more legal cases that affect big things. There could be more light codes from the sun which accelerate things. I guess we don't know, but um, yeah, if we just keep putting our attention on what we're passionate about and what the change that we want to see, I feel like that's really powerful. And if we're still participating in parts of the system because they're convenient or because we enjoy it, I think that's okay as well. Yeah, thank you for giving me permission to be addicted to Amazon, <laughs> Instacart and stuff. Sometimes I just laugh at myself. I'm like, you're someone that talks shit about the system so much yet still you know, willingly participates in it. But it is a process. It's you know, a process, it's a process for sure, yeah. 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 I look forward to learning how to grow some food. I think that's going to be mm. a good a good step, you know. I mean, it's like start out with a few little herbs, right? And then you got your own basil at least. That's like a tiny tiny little baby step into being self-sufficient. It really is, and yeah, the, I think the connection to nature, just being in the garden and watching something grow from a seed or a seedling to something that's in your kitchen. And then consuming that, like I think there's so much fulfillment, there's so much peace and joy in those processes that a lot of us have become disconnected from by spending a lot of time inside or just buying everything from the supermarket and all of those things. So Yeah, totally. Yeah, that connection to nature, whether it's the sun or water or growing your own food, is a, just a really beautiful way to exist as well. Alice and I uh, took a weekend trip a few days ago and um, we stumbled across this little plant shop a um, couple couple hours from here and uh they have a bunch of san pedro cactuses for sale and so we, we bought a shitload of them <laughs> we're, we're gonna grow our own plant medicine that's my first gardening foray here since i moved to texas the there funny thing is about those plants is they're um those cacti they are legal to grow and possess but they're illegal to process and ingest okay because then it becomes mescaline mm -hmm. it's really funny mm -hmm. the laws are so funny like that i go really like it's like say you you have a cow pasture and psilocybin mushrooms with psilocybin uh, grow out there, it's not illegal to watch them grow. But the minute you go chop them and put them in a baggie, now you're you have a class whatever drug. It's so weird to me. Yeah, it's wild. Yeah. Do you have any experience with uh, plant medicines and things in that realm? I, I think I might have asked you that before. Mm. That's not your lane no. thus far. No, I appreciate the power of the plant medicine and the transformational impacts it can have and accessing the subconscious. Um, that's what the gold's doing as well. So the gold's actually, because it goes into that amygdala and into the, um, the medulla oblongata, it's actually, so that it's tapping into those nerve endings and all of that subconscious to release a lot of the causal conditioning that's there. So it's doing it in a way that is kind of, um, you know, obviously take a plant medicine and you're in that state and you get shown beautiful teachings or things that you can look at. Well, the subconscious, when it's releasing that conditioning or that programming, is doing a very similar thing. So it's doing it with light from the sun as the medicine, if you will. And as you're doing that over time and building up that quotient of light in the vehicle, then you're working through that layer of purification in a different way, in a way that it resonates much more to me to do it that way. I mean, the, the plant medicine and everything on the earth is getting its source from the sun. So for me, it's almost like a more direct path that's cool to the light that's cool yeah, yeah thinking about those those cacti sitting out in the desert sun and how much yeah. energy and data they're yeah. building from that sunlight yeah that yeah. makes sense so you're more of just you're like a cacti walking around <laughs> the planet doing your sun gazing and grounding and drinking the structured water yeah i appreciate that i i think why i asked you this time and i asked you before and i forgot the answer is Sometimes I meet people that are really tapped in. I mean, mm. I often meet people like you doing what I do here. Mm. And I'll intuit erroneously that they've, at least at some point, worked with psychedelics because mm. they're so tapped in. Mm. They have a certain air about them or a certain consciousness. It's hard for me to imagine that they found another way to get there. You know, <laughs> and, and it's a great reminder that there are many ways. And 
how important it is to follow your intuition and what what path speaks to you you know mm -hmm. which for me for a very long time was just breath work meditation kundalini yoga i mean i made a lot of progress a lot of healing a lot of understanding a lot of uh, expanded consciousness in those ways and i probably would have been fine if i would have just kept doing that forever and then as nature called and i went down another path and um and that's been great too mm. you know but i i appreciate the fact that there are many windows that lead into the mansion mm. you know? yeah great it's 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 i mean one way or another we've got to do it is how i see it right. like the stuff that's stored in there that's uh it can be this life it can be genetic codes that are passed through our dna it can be um, past lives for us but there's all of that causal causal conditioning that has to be unwound if you will so that we actually have that solid platform to then be able to move forward from but once it's still all there and we're in that stressful state or that fearful state then we can't actually access those higher processes it's got to kind of come out it's got to purify first and that you know can take lifetimes so i think it's the the power of seeing through that with a plant medicine or with the gold or with fasting um you know and different different other things you can do like a vipassana or a vision quest i think they also help yeah with accessing retreats. a lot of that yeah i interviewed a guy the other yeah. day about darkness retreats and i'm like i'll go smoke dmt no problem with the darkness retreat, which is terrifying for many people yes darkness retreat he was describing it and i'm like ah oh, my soul literally is like luke you have to do this sign up now you're doing this <laughs> you need this and then my ego is like nope i'm not gonna be with myself with that degree of intimacy for that long too scary you know? how long was it gonna be uh like a week yeah yeah a week yeah there's uh his name's uh pavel and um, he works with a woman, I think she's actually an Aussie, uh, who is, I forget her name offhand, but she's based in Thailand. She does her darkness retreats and she's been a legit breatharian for I don't know, 20, 30 years. Wow. Like, does not eat at all. Wow. And you hear about that, it's kind of like <laughs> Bigfoot, you know, you're like, ah, I don't know, <laughs> yeah. But I've heard her interviews. Uh, she was on my friend Alex Zek's show, The Way Forward. Um, again, we'll we'll find her name and put it in the show notes, but beautiful soul. I mean, just mm. incredible wisdom carrier, elder. And um, yeah, she doesn't eat. She just lives on prana, you know? Mm. And I, I really believe her. Over the years, there's been people that have claimed that. And then you hear, oh yeah, but backstage, they're eating salami or whatever. But uh, I think she's the real deal. And so she leads these retreats and he's done a number of them. And and people that I know that have done those uh, darkness retreats have had incredibly transformative experiences. But yeah, it's a, that's a real edge for me. I don't know. It's just terrifying to me for some reason. So yeah, I've got a friend that did a 15 day one and didn't, wow. and, and didn't eat. Right. Yeah. That's part of it. Yeah. So that's part, I think at this one in Thailand, they get a little light food here and there. But some of them, from what I understand, yeah, you're you're actually fasting at the same time. Yeah. And uh, people like trip balls. You get the endogenous DMT from being in the darkness and all this melatonin you're producing. I mean, people have just, my friend Aubrey has done a number of them. I think he made a documentary about it as well. And yeah, people say, you don't need to do psychedelics. You just go sit in the dark for a few days and you'll trip your ass off. So maybe one of these days, you know, I'll do it, make a podcast about it. It must be one of the most intense experiences you can have. Right. Because being in a dark room, as you say, after a few days would be trippy enough. Yeah. But actually not eating as well, there'd be part of you that would be questioning everything. 100%. <laughs> There's one last thing I wanted to ask you. You mentioned fasting and another thing that I've been wanting to do for some time is uh, do a water fast, mm. which is weirdly enough, some experiment I haven't tried. I've done a number of juice fasts and things like mm. that over the years, but um, I got the intuitive hit that a water fast with the mana mm. and or the mana gold mm. could be pretty epic 100 percent. because you technically would still just be drinking water because you can just this is water soluble so you just mix it in water and that would be like your mana tea basically and you could use that in place of just straight water have you heard yeah. of anyone doing that or have you tried it or yeah yeah i've i've done it quite a lot oh um, you have yeah and i've got a friend uh actually lives up in oregon 
and he's a breatharian, so he doesn't need to eat. For real? Yeah. Not a Bigfoot style, but no. the, real de- the real deal? The real deal, yeah. Oh, man. So he bad, does man. eat every now and again, but he doesn't need to. Okay. So he'll eat communally, or when I was up there, I made a couple of um, uh, meals of dal, as an example, and like he had a couple of mouthfuls. Um, but when I arrived, he hadn't eaten for 30 days. Wow. Um, but yeah, he goes through periods where he'll have two sachets of mana in the morning with his spring water, and that's all he'll have. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. And with the gold, it'll be super fascinating. Um, yeah, as I said, we only did just, just did our first bulk production of that last week. So I'm super exciting to do it. Super excited to do a whole bunch of tests. I want to, I want to try that. We, we should stay in touch and see if we could pull it off. Even, you know, a 72 hour one or something like that, yeah. right? Schedules permitting, but that would be a really interesting experiment. Yeah. And yeah. I've got some pure 24 karat gold nanoparticles here that I'll give you before I leave. Yes. And that's just fasting with that and spring water, but will be super interesting. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder what would happen if you were to combine that fast with uh, urine therapy mm. during that. Mm. A couple of my friends, mm. we did a podcast the other day with a couple of friends of mine, and uh, I forget which one of them was, but they talked about, call it recycling or no, looping. Okay. Call it looping, where you're doing your fasting and doing the urine therapy during your water fast. And then, you know, you're basically, no, no, sorry, I think I got it wrong. You're not even drinking water. You're just looping your own pee. <laughs> sounds, sounds gross, I know. But they were describing how there's this powerful uh, psychoactive experience that happens. How long are they doing that for? I don't know. I'd have to go back and listen to the podcast. It was like a three and a half, four hour podcast. And that was just oh. one of the threads. And I was like, oh, looping. And they were talking about, yeah, when you do a water fast and then you're you know, looping in that you're, you're just reconsuming all of your urine, essentially, that you, you reach a really interesting state of consciousness. I forget oh. the details, but there was something about that. So it would start getting pretty pretty concentrated after a while. Yeah, something like that. I'll have to ask him. I forget which one of the guys it was. It was Alex Zach, Josh Trent, and Aaron Abke. And it was one of the three. It was like, oh yeah, looping, blah, blah, blah. Then you start tripping out after the third day or something. And it was like, that's interesting. I don't know if I'm there yet, but <laughs> it's, you know, I hear things like that. And then sometimes there's a voice that's like, you gotta try that. And then there's the resistance of like that sounds gross or scary and then I don't do it mm. but I never forget it you know it always mm. kind of like there's a bookmark in my subconscious that's like ah there's intuitively there's something to that that is begging for a further um you know inquiry how long do you think you'd do it for I don't know whatever the protocol is first I'm going to try it with your monogol <laughs> and water um and then I'll see about the urine part yeah well, goddamn, dude. I want to remind people, go to lukestray.com slash mana. Use the code Luke20. Get yourself some of this mana gold or the regular mana. Um, I fully vouch for what you're doing. I love the work you're doing. I love your commitment to integrity, product quality, sourcing, the whole shit, your design element, your graphics, like everything is just super clean and top notch. And, and you're also just an incredible guy and a beautiful podcast guest. So thank you for making the time and that long flight. Uh, I know you didn't fly here just for this, but I appreciate the sacrifice you made to be here. <laughs> uh, anything else you want us to know before we go? Like, do you have anything else in the pipeline after you get gold out and, and that's up and running? Or is that project like leaving you with, you know, the sense of accomplishment that's going to last a while? Yeah, that's it. So there's the three main raw materials that we deal with. It's the ocean plasma with the ormus in it. It's the shilajit. And now the nano gold, and that's the full suite that we're going to focus on. Cool. Uh, there is a, a, a so the mana has ocean plasma and shilajit in it, with the chai flavoring to help with the shilajit taste. Uh, we've separated that into two products, so there is one just called shilajit now. Oh, okay. Which has five hundred milligrams of pure shilajit, so it's half the dosage that's in the mana. And then there's an ocean product now as well. Oh, cool. Which just has 1,000 milligrams of the concentrated ocean plasma ah. at that 330,000 parts per million. Oh, I'm sorry. That reminds me of one more question. So we were talking about the quinton minerals, right? The hypertonic, which yes. is the super salty one. And then the isotonic, which can be used for blood transfusions for dogs, if you ever needed to do that. Um, how does your 
sea mineral products stack up in terms of potency if someone was like, well, I'm already taking Quinton, mm. you know, not to shit on Quinton. I have some in the fridge. I actually mm. took a swig this morning and I took two doses of mana today. So more is more for me. But um, how, how does your ocean stuff stack up against Quinton for people that are already using Quinton or like hip to that? Yeah, I love Kinton as well, just to okay. uh, put that out there. They're a great brand. Um, you know, they've been around a long time. They've been very successful. Great product and brings in great awareness around ocean plasma because it is so powerful. The biggest difference is that ours is 10 times more concentrated. Uh, or another way of okay. saying that is it's a 1,000% more concentrated. Um, the other huge difference is that theirs is so high in sodium chloride. Whereas ours is lower in sodium chloride and really high in those other minerals that our body's starving for, in particular magnesium, potassium, sulfur, which is the third, they're the three most abundant minerals in the body outside of uh, sodium. Cool. Yeah. I knew you were going to give a respectful answer, you know, <laughs> which is usually the case. It's rare that someone's like, oh, that product sucks. Ours is better. But I was legitimately curious about that because I do take both. And I'm like, is that Oof. overkill? Am I wasting money on that? So... Yeah, it makes sense. If yours are more concentrated, you could probably, you know, if budget's an issue, you could probably just take mana and not have to spend your money on the uh, the Quinton in addition. All right, cool. And the symbiosis between the ocean plasma and the Shiller Jet's really beautiful as well. It's like where one's kind of low in our lab results, the other one kind of picks it up. And we kind of look at that as the the black and white keys on a piano. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah, so it's like the ocean plasma is the white keys because once we put it through our process, it actually turns white. And then the shilajit's like the black keys and it's like the two complement each other beautifully. And it's like, um, you know, if you we are singing a song as a human expression. So if you want to sing your best song, you want to have access to all the keys on the piano, right? Love it. Yeah. Ebony and Ivory living together in perfect harmony. That's Stevie it. Wonder. <laughs> <laughs> all right dude thanks for joining us we'll see you next time thanks luke appreciate it